では、えー、レーザーラクエアさんによりますポリブロットのためのドッカーよろしくお願いいたしますいいはい。Um, and, and how can we make that easier?、Uh, and also,、uh, how can we make、uh, contribution to open source easier for people who may not necessarily be familiar with sort of the stack of tools、uh, that you use on your project?、Um, the, uh, there's a lot of、uh, different things. Happening in the ecosystem that are really exciting.、Um, so, I think that Docker can really help a lot of projects out. And I wanted to talk about a little bit of、uh, detail uh, how and why.、Uh, so, it's sort of expanded a little bit from the original definition of strictly a polyglot of someone who is switching programming languages into、uh, kind of just a Person who bridges a sort of a couple of different worlds, whether it's going from Perl to C to Ruby to C sharp,、um, or going from dev to ops to、uh, management is its own sort of type of language.、Uh, Docker usually probably can't help you there, but、uh, we're going to talk about all the ways that it can. So, Uh, welcome to the talk.、Uh, I really appreciate your participation. So,、um, thank you so much for coming out and listening to me speak.、Uh, to speak at the conference is a really big honor for me.、Um, I really like Japan, and、uh, it's been a great trip so far.、Uh, I originally came to Japan about、uh, eight months ago in October.、Um, And、uh, this trip has been a lot better because it's a lot longer. <laughs> the original trip was about four days. So, today we're going to talk about Docker for polyglots. Like I said, a polyglot is someone who speaks multiple languages. And、um, I just want to give a big round of applause, really quick, to the organizers for putting this conference together.、Uh, if any of you have ever run a conference, you probably know that it's really, really In depth thing that involves a lot of planning and sort of、uh, batting around with various parties to make sure that things go smoothly. So, I'd like to say I really appreciate uh, uh, putting together a conference. So,、uh, who am I? Uh, uh, my name is Nathan LeClaire.、Uh, on Twitter, my handle is at upthecyberpunks. Uh, and I'm an open source engineer at Docker. I joined the company about a year and a half ago.、Uh, when I joined, there was probably about 35 people, and I joined thinking, well, this seems like pretty cool stuff, and I get to actually work on something that's directly related to Linux low level、uh, details, and also I get to write Go. Which is a really interesting programming language. So, I had been writing Go as a hobby, not for my job, for a while. And I thought,、eh, this Docker stuff is pretty interesting, it might catch on. And then, over the past year and a half, Docker really has grown a lot and expanded, and people seem very interested in it.、Um, there's a lot of reasons why that is, and I'm going to talk about one of those reasons today. And I think one of the reasons is just that it really helps to reduce the pain of traditional sort of setting up environments and configuring them, and、uh, essentially all of the yak shaving stuff that you normally have to go through to actually get to the objective of what you were originally trying to do. 
Uh, by day, I work on a project called Docker Machine. Uh, I'm not going to be going into too much detail about what that is today, but you can see over on the right here that we have an extremely cute logo. So that's got to count for something. Uh, Docker Machine is a tool to actually get started using Docker um, easier. And so I really enjoy the project because we're going in a lot of really cool directions. And also one of the things that Docker Machine enables you to do is actually very quickly bootstrap cloud servers that are running Docker. I really think that the future of where development is headed is towards a thin client model where we all are sort of developing on big beefy boxes in the cloud that have good bandwidth and, and good uh, disk I.O. and that kind of thing. And our local computers aren't taxed nearly as much. Uh, that being said, there's still a lot going for local development. And I think there's a lot of problems that need to be solved before we sort of get to the next step. So I love open source and I, I work on it for my day job. I used to be an engineer who was in sales, uh, and then I switched because working on open source is just a lot more fun. So um, I love Japan. This is the conference that I was talking about. So I had the great honor of getting to speak with people like Matt's, uh, and also the honor at this conference of getting to speak with some pretty legendary hackers. So I just wanted to take a moment and give a quick shout out to Japan and to uh, all the cool stuff that's going on here. So um, just to sort of set up the frame for the talk today, uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, the mission of where we'd really like to go with Docker. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of buzz and uh, sort of noise in the ecosystem and, and uh, in the media, there's a very strong association between Docker and Linux container technology. Um, to me, it's not really that surprising because Docker really rose to prominence as an engine to actually make using Linux containers easier and more friendly. But also, if you sort of look at the vision of our founder, Solomon Hikes, and where everything is going, I think there's a really interesting story to be told. And uh, I feel like I want to be a part of it, and I want to invite you to be a part of it as well. And that story is that there's all of these creative people in the world, and there's all of this incredible technology. But the problem is that all of the people are on one island, and all of the technology is on another island. And frequently, it's very inaccessible and hard to reach and hard to use, uh, and consequently, hard to do creative stuff with. Um, even if you look at the original example of, of Docker uh, itself, the container engine, one of the, the criticisms that Docker has really endured um, kind of coming to prominence is that uh, well, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, it's all been done before. So you might be familiar with things like jails and FreeBSD or um, zones in Solaris. And these things are all sort of predecessors uh, or similar technologies to what Docker is doing today. And I think that a lot of people look at Docker and say, Oh, what's different? Well, why is this actually catching on? Um, and I think that the real reason that that is is because it's taking this technology that previously was very uh, accessible to only a very small amount of the population and now making it available for a lot of different people to use. So there's sort of an act of democratization that has taken place and it's enabled all of this creativity. Uh, I think it's a really special thing, and it's something that we're going to keep drilling down on to sort of keep reducing that friction. So uh, we want to actually give people these tools that actually enable massive innovation. Um, we want Docker 
to actually be the thing that bridges all of these people who otherwise would be writing cool stuff that are not able to because of technology barriers and actually to help them and give them access to these tools and make them easier to use and, and more reliable and more usable and actually do that. And so we started with containers and then we're going to keep moving on um, to other things. And so you can see that now all of these people who previously were sad uh, because you know only a few of them had these little light bulbs which are kind of meant to represent uh, the ideas for things that they can actually make, now have access to all these tools and, and new ideas and, and um, are gonna be making new cool things. So uh, to kind of take a step back and, and look at the problem statement a little bit more, I wanted to actually look at some facts. Um, and this is actually a really cute drawing that doesn't necessarily have any relation, but is from our Docker birthday party. You can see the Linux penguin and the go gopher there. It's pretty cute. Um, one fact is that variety is really a, a truth of life in sort of modern uh, technologists' world. Uh, developers, they want to use a variety of different programming languages. Um, there's a very, very concrete sense of wanting to use the right tool for the right job. Now, occasionally, it doesn't really work out that way, and uh, I'm not going to name any names, but people do rewrite almost everything in JavaScript. Uh, and so there's kind of a little bit of a, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail problem. But um, the, the truth is that I think good engineers want to actually use the right tool for the right job. Uh, and so in doing that, it kind of really introduces a, a, a tricky problem that now it actually complicates the process of setting up development environments and then running operations for those. So it's hard enough to actually set up a development environment and get all of the tooling correct get all of the packages that you need to work on installed correctly, uh, make sure that all the versions are lined up the right way. And historically, a lot of tools have sort of cropped up to help to solve this problem. Um, uh, but they're not really perfect. And in fact, a lot of those tools, I think, can actually be used together with Docker to sort of get the best of both, best of both worlds um, and have a sort of an elegant and automated way to set up an environment. Um, and likewise, that's not even to mention the fact that actually running operations for all of this stuff, um, let's say that you're a company who has three different programming languages for applications that you're running in production, well, that's gonna be dramatically more difficult than just having one. Uh, operations, is a constant struggle. It's a constant battle to actually keep the website alive, to keep it healthy, and to fight against all of the forces that actually work against you, which is a lot. Um, just basic operations entails keeping out all of the bad people on the internet, which there are a lot of. Um, keeping your website up. Um, if you have attempted to keep a website up for any amount of time, uh, you'll know that it's very, very difficult. And um, you know, the larger of a scale that you're running at, the more and more common that failure is. So actually one uh, kind of funny example was at a conference that I attended last year, they actually had this sort of elaborate setup in their data center. They weren't running in the cloud. They were actually running their own physical hardware. Um, and they had a pretty good setup. They were mostly fairly reliable, but um, at one point, they ended up having all these issues and failures because uh, essentially what had happened was a screw had actually come loose in the chassis of the rack in the data center, and the disk, the actual literal physical disk, kept spinning, 
as disks do, and then like came loose and like came out of the rack and basically crashed a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so you know now we live in this age of like Amazon Web Services and all of these things that make running web applications easier, but at the same time, failures at the application level and, and other places are still very very common, and so anything that can help with reproducibility and uh, you know ultimately uh, make your life less complicated in terms of running operations is a good thing. Um, now whether or not Docker is the right thing for easing operations is kind of another discussion, um, but I certainly think that it can help to actually bridge the gap between developers and operations because it's kind of becoming one thing uh, in a new class of tools where people can actually speak the same language. Previously, developers and operations were very adversarial, and in a lot of ways, they still can be today. But I think Docker is a really good step in the right direction towards actually unifying the languages of development and operations. Another fact is that technology actually changes really, really rapidly. So just taking front-end web development as a really, really uh, a strong example of something that's easy to pick on in this area, basically it feels like the whole stack for front-end web development gets reinvented completely every six months. Um, you know, if you were doing front-end web development, so if you were writing a lot of JavaScript eh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, Everyone was all about Angular, so everyone was very, very fixated on Angular JS, and that seemed like it was really going to be the next big thing in front end. Um, likewise, there was a tool called Grunt, which um, was mostly what people were sort of using for their build. Um, and then in the past year and a half, everything's completely changed again. Uh, now people are using a tool called Gulp for doing build. They're still using Grunt, so that complicates it even further, right? Now there are like two different JavaScript build tools. And um, also, this framework React has really caught on and become very popular. Um, and so, frankly, I don't really have the time to invest in relearning all of the tooling and everything every six months if I want to contribute to my friend's JavaScript project just a little bit. Um, so one of the things that's really important to me that I'm going to talk about is making contribution to open source easier. The more that you can kind of help people to actually get started coding and to actually work on your application, uh, the more that you will actually get activity and contribution and it's, it's very possible that that one person that contributes that killer feature, well, um, it uh, might uh, not be the case that they do that if you don't have an environment that's easy to set up and get going with. So, like I said, not every developer on your team is going to be an expert in tooling for every language, but they might want to contribute. And the more friction that you have, the less productivity that you're going to have. So another fact is that, in my opinion, tooling in general is really difficult. Um, I picked an example of Maven, which is a Java build tool, being really intimidating to a Go developer. Um, so I write Go, um, and any time that I look at, at Maven or, or build scripts, I kind of want to run away screaming because uh, it's just very labyrinthian and complex, and I'm sort of worried that if I change something in the uh, palm.xml file, I'll sort of accidentally summon some sort of uh, entity that I don't like. <laughs> uh, and um, so I think tooling you know, is, is something that's very necessary for languages. You have to have things like Maven and you have to have things like GoFunt, which is a tool for actually um, like formatting your code uh, in Go. But 
It's very, uh, it can be very um, unwelcoming to newcomers. And so anything that can increase automation and make those things easier to use will actually help people to get up to speed, right? And I think that the more that you can kind of get people over the hump and like get them started on working on something that's like real work and it's really productive, um, the faster that you can do that, the more that they're gonna be willing to actually invest the effort later on to actually kind of dig in and get a much deeper, richer understanding of the tools. Now, you also potentially could have the opposite problem, which is that they never wanna learn it at all, but I think it's worth the risk to actually make it easier for newcomers. Um, and because of this sort of like tooling being really difficult, Contributing to open source is, is also difficult and it's intimidating. Um, there are many, many projects that I see that I think are really interesting. I'd like to dig into the source code, um, kind of sprinkle some things in there to kind of get a feel for how it works. But their build tool chain is just so elaborate and um, you know, like hard to reproduce or you know, might actually mess with the environment that I currently have set up on my computer. Uh, so it's sort of a risky uh, proposition to go messing with things um, that, you know, I just don't bother. Uh, so it's just kind of sad, right? Um, open source is really, really very, uh, it's a very good thing. I think it's a very, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a positive thing for the community and for the world, basically. And um, you know, I think that really we should be trying to encourage contribution however we can. Um, and you know, uh, additionally, I, I think like it's been really too easy to sort of shrug off like the newcomer as well. Well, you should just you know RTFM. Uh, you should read the docs or, you know, um, you should just know this uh, because it's just, that's what real programmers know. Um, but it's a lot harder to actually dig into the problem of, well, where are people stumbling and how can we make that better? Because those are the people who are gonna be making cool stuff tomorrow. Um, and uh, another fact is just that, uh, you know, you might be familiar with the idea of uh, bus factor. So um, the bus factor risk is uh, really high uh, in a lot of cases in modern development, um, especially in companies. Um, in closed source proprietary software, the bus factor risk is usually huge because there's probably one or two people who out of practical necessity actually set up the environments for everyone and then the knowledge of how to do that is sort of closely guarded and esoteric, um, partially because it might be part of that person's job function. Um, so if, quote, the person who sets up the environments, um, you know, you may know this person from your own work, they're the ones who actually know how to actually get things going. Um, if they were hit by a bus tomorrow, would it be easy for your team to keep going? Would there not be any issues? Or would it be really hard? Um, and um, well, there's a variety of reasons uh, why that might be the case. But one thing is that it might not be easy to actually destroy a given development environment and then rebuild it from scratch automatically. Um, so you know, starting with the emergence of tools like Puppet and Chef, um, I think that uh, developers sort of began to see that automation is a really good thing and, you know, instead of uh, spending all of this time shaving the yak and getting your environment set up, you should actually try and automate that as much as possible. The issue that I've seen with tools like Puppet and Chef um, and, and uh, you know, that I've run into myself in the past is that the learning curve on those is very high. Um, usually the people who make an investment in those technologies, um, the reason they do so is because they intend to use it for operations. And so it will have a much bigger payoff than actually just setting up your development environment. 
it's something that you'll use to actually set up, secure, and, and run effectively your operational cluster. Um, so I think that Docker has really resonated with people because it's a way to do this that's, you know, it's pretty simple and uh, also includes built-in mechanisms for things like distribution that, uh, you know, just work. Um, there have definitely been issues in the past uh, with a variety of different things. Uh, for instance, in the, in the version one of the registry, which is the component that you actually use to push and pull Docker images, uh, it's kind of like a Git remote. Uh, the version one was notoriously very slow. Um, and now there's a version two out that's much, much faster and better. But um, the point is that, you know, it was something, and, and that something worked well enough to actually uh, motivate people to kind of pick up Docker and keep going. Um, another fact of life is dependency hell. So um, uh, you may not be able to read it, but um, this is an error message uh, from attempting to compile Open Resty, uh, which is a, uh, it's a, essentially it's a, module that you can use to script Nginx with Lua. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to read, but it says um, uh, dot slash configure error. The HTTP rewrite module requires the PCRE library. You can either disable the module or install the PCRE library or build the PCRE library using minus minus with PCRE. Um, now, some people might be able to look at this error message and immediately know the correct uh, package to install from apt uh, or the right place to go on the internet, but um, you know, this is a, a really great example of somewhere where friction gets introduced into the development process. Um, in this case, I had actually just cloned this repo and ran, you know, uh, dot slash configure, make, make install, and this is the error message that you see. Now, in this case, the Open Resty project actually has really good docs, and they meticulously sort of document what are the packages that you should install on your system um, to uh, actually get going with working on Open Resty. But I've tried to work on many, many projects that are much worse about that. Um, and so, uh, you know, Dependency hell is just a fact of life. You're going to have all of these uh, things that you need in order to run your program. And unfortunately, I think that we're headed for a world where that's just gonna get worse and worse and worse because now you're talking about potentially wanting to work on applications that have all of these moving pieces and all of these different things that they depend on. So you might wanna work on an open source web app that depends on having PostgreSQL installed, as well as having Redis installed, as well as having your background job worker uh, queue installed, uh, as well as these libraries and image magic and, and, and all of these things. So I don't think it's getting any better in terms of the requirements of programs. I do think it's getting better in terms of our ability to actually quickly access those. So um, basically, uh, I think that Docker can help a lot for this. Docker provides a way of distributing applications and it also provides orchestration tools for developing them. And the end game is to actually reduce friction to the point where transitioning between projects is seamless. So, one of the things that's pretty cool about Docker is you can actually do a build where you bake this immutable file system image and it's sort of like a little snapshot of the file system at any given point in time. So for instance, you have all of the packages and dependencies that you need to run your program installed and it also provides a way of actually distributing that. So I already mentioned the registry. Well, you can actually push and pull Docker images just like you can push and pull source code with Git. Um, and so could we actually make the internet programmable, right? Um, 
there are all these eager developers, like I mentioned earlier, that want to actually program all of the things on the internet. Um, the internet today, one of the most common forms of creative expression is that people have web applications that they put on the internet. And pretty soon we're gonna have all of these devices that are connected to the internet all the time, and they're fully programmable. So in the future, we're gonna have a real problem because well, we already have this problem because there are all of these cool things that you could do, but there are all these software walled gardens. So, you know, like one is actually deploying an application and, um, you know, being able to run all of the operations that you need to sort of run that application effectively. Uh, likewise, if you want to make an app for a phone or something, you have all these walled gardens around that. Um, and the goal or sort of the end game is to actually use Docker as a tool to paper over that. And there are a variety of ways that Docker helps with that today. And then in the future, where we want to actually take it is we want to make it so that um, it becomes a lot more viable for people to uh, effectively program the internet. Uh, a little bit about my personal vision for where we can go with this stuff. My dream is that Simplicity will become the modus operandum for the way that we do things. Um, this is a Fender jazz bass. I think that Fender actually made in Japan, coincidentally. Uh, those are very well known for their build quality. Um, and I think that one of the things that's very appealing about Fender is they're a, it's a, a simple instrument, so it's a simple guitar. Um, and you kind of just plug and play, and out of the box, it's a really great experience. There's not a lot that you have to do to the sound of a Fender guitar or bass uh, or amplifier to actually get it to sound good. You don't have to do anything fancy. You just plug it, turn one knob, and it works really well. So my dream is to get that same kind of plug and play simplicity to actually developing things. Likewise, I'd like to see things become a lot more uniform. Um, right now, the move from one developer's computer to another developer's computer to CI to staging to production, there's a lot of differences in all of those environments. And it would be much, much more productive for everyone if we could take those environments and make them look more similar. So a big thing in the DevOps movement is getting developers and operations to communicate more effectively, well, this is one of the ways that you can actually do that. If things look the same through the whole life cycle of the app, then it will be a lot easier for developers to talk to operations and sort of figure out what's going wrong when something's going wrong or how do we make things better than they are today. I also have a kind of a vision of what I call Phoenix development. Uh, there's a notion in, uh, in operations of a Phoenix deployment, which is essentially the idea that any of your servers could burst into flames at any given time and everything would be totally fine because that server is not some special pet server that you take care of and ensure that it's always up and running and it's like customized and you SSH into it and make whatever changes you need to make. And it's this like unique pet server that you keep exactly how you want it, but couldn't ever rebuild from scratch, uh, easily at least. Phoenix deployment actually implies that you should be able to kill a server at any given time and whatever, all of your servers look the same. So it's no problem to actually automate the creation of new things. Likewise, I think that it should be an important uh, element in any modern developer's toolkit to be able to just blow away their development environment completely and get started from scratch very, very quickly. Um, a good example of this is actually uh, on the Docker machine project. We use Docker to do our, our compilation, to do our builds. And so I can create a new server and start working on it um, pretty quickly. 
Um, so in about five minutes, I can actually be productive uh, on a new computer. Um, uh, and so, well, uh, what is a polyglot? Well, one thing is it's someone who speaks multiple programming languages. Um, some very great examples here. Uh, there are also a variety of tooling languages. For instance, I mentioned that Maven is really, really intimidating. Um, and uh, also there's dev speak, so developers say weird things like, we need to add some migrations to run for the database and some controllers and also some jobs in the background queue. Um, you know, anything that we can do to actually translate that better into terms that everyone in all the different roles of the organization can understand um, is a good thing. Uh, increasing communication and, and making people actually able to understand each other is a really good thing. It's something I think that historically engineers have not really been that good at, and I think it's our responsibility to improve that. Um, there's also operator language, like, well, we need to use some load balancers or uh, S3 bucket, um, things like that. They're very intimidating to newcomers. And you know, I think one thing Docker has a huge potential for is to sort of create this standardized like breadcrumb trail that you can actually use to trace all the stuff that people are talking about. Um, and then instead of some sort of like collection of spaghetti scripts, um, you know, if you use Docker and the Docker tooling, you can actually kind of come in and understand what the heck is going on. Um, so Docker lets you actually define an environment pretty simply. This is an example of a Docker file, and it's just a very simple little file um, with its own DSL that you can essentially use to build an image. Um, so one thing that we're, we've been sort of talking about lately is like we feel like the Docker file is the new README, because uh, you can actually say, these are the packages that I want to have installed in my environment, but you know, not only can you document that, you can actually run through a Docker file and use it to produce that build artifact that anybody can get going with. Um, and one thing that I, I find really appealing about a Docker file is uh, it doesn't look all that different from like a simple shell script. Uh, so, you know, instead of some things that have these like very intense configuration languages and um, you know, kind of like a 20 line way of describing like this is how you install the package. Um, you can just say run, app get install, uh, whatever you want and it's all there in the Docker file. Um, so I'm kind of uh, like running out of time a little bit because uh, I've been quite verbose but here's just a very quick example of using Docker to actually set something up. So. I alluded to the OpenResty project earlier. Uh, OpenResty is a very, very uh, cool project um, which uh, actually lets you create very high performance web applications um, by uh, using Lua to script Nginx. So you can actually take advantage of the event loop from Nginx and use it to build really, really high performance web applications. Uh, for instance, it's used by the company Cloudflare a lot uh, to do all of their sort of really cool, like reverse proxy, uh, like changing the size of images and render them for mobile on the fly and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm really interested in this technology, but I don't know anything about Lua, and I only know a little bit about Nginx. Um, so, you know, if I want to actually set up OpenResty manually, I have to, uh, install all these dependencies. Um, you, can, you, can, um, you can actually go to the OpenRSD page and they have really good docs. So this is actually maybe not the best example ever because they have very good documentation. Um, actually, like uh, I remember uh, like reading something that Larry Wall said about uh, documentation basically being a good attribute for a programmer to have because you're lazy uh, and you should write documentation 
because you're lazy and you, you don't want people bothering you to like ask you questions all the time. Um, so I kind of think of this as like another step of this, right? Like um, instead of like having people ask you, hey, how do I build this? And like what modules do I need to install and stuff? Like you can put it in a Docker file and not only tell them, all right, this is what you need to install, but also here's this image and if you just want to check it out and run it really quickly, just run this Docker image. Um, so uh, then you have to actually download the package and then untar it and uh, run configure and make and all that stuff. Uh, and I said, fortunately, that project has really good documentation, but what if it didn't? Uh, if it didn't, we might end up somewhere like here uh, on Stack Overflow uh, with someone answering, asking this question. Um, you can't really read it very well, but basically on the top you can see one of the posters is asking, I'm trying to compile this thing and I'm getting this really esoteric error message. I don't know what it means or what the heck it wants me to install as a dependency. And then you can see that the, the poster basically says, oh, install libcurses. Um, okay, how was I supposed to know that? Uh, it's very hard for project authors to actually uh, say in a uniform way, install this module, because whoever's trying to compile your program, they might be on Mac OS X, they might be on Lin uh, Red Hat, they might be on Debian, you don't really know. Um, and so I think Docker can really help to reduce a lot of this friction, because you can kind of just bake an image one time and distribute it. Um, you know, so, all right, well, we made OpenResty manually one time, but what if we want to actually install onto another computer or share the app with a friend or colleague? Uh, well, the first thing every clever uh, programmer or automation engineer will do is uh, replace things with a tiny shell script. Um, but unfortunately, we have this evil boss uh, who says, yeah, I, I know that you develop on Debian, but actually uh, I need this to run on, on Red Hat. Um, so our tiny shell script won't be any use um, because we don't have apt on Red Hat. Uh, and you know, meanwhile, uh, while all this is happening, the developer is basically saying, installing software is so boring. I came into this project because I wanted to script Nginx with Lua and you know, I'm basically getting caught up shaving the yak to like sort of do all this like boilerplate and infrastructure around my project. Um, so you know, one solution that you can use is, is Docker. So you can actually make a Docker file. Once again, it's really hard to read, but um, uh, you, there's a variety of, uh, I'd be happy to sort of like send you this Docker file if you wanted. Uh, you can use a Docker file and actually use that to do builds that will run on any OS that has a compatible kernel. Um, so one of the things that's cool about Docker is what you're distributing around is all of the user space, like file system things um, that run the program. Uh, and so the compatibility is not actually in user land, it's in the kernel. Uh, one of the things that the kernel is really good at is not breaking backwards compatibility. Um, so actually an uncanny amount of the time you can create things that, for instance, use uh, Debian as a base image, as that underlying uh, thing. And you know, if you're using stock kernels, if you're using vanilla uh, kernels, it will run on a variety of different Linux distributions. Um, so, so once again, Docker is kind of this uh, thing that papers over all the little gaps that usually you might run into uh, as a stumbling block. Uh, Linux distributions is a really great example. Uh, Historically, that kind of fragmentation is really annoying because like, you have to make packages for all these different distros and well, you might have your buddy who runs on Arch and you're sort of like, oh, I made a .deb but I want my buddy who runs on Arch Linux to be able to use this. Um, and so Docker can help a lot with that problem. Um, and so uh, you can actually Docker build uh, with a tag, so Nathan LeClaire is my username on Docker Hub, and OpenResty is the name of the image. 
So you can Docker build, it will run and kind of do the thing and spit out a bunch of output, and then at the end, you'll have this image that you can actually share with other people. Um, Docker push to actually push it. You know, images are fairly large because you're kind of shipping around a whole file system. Um, but distribution has all this really interesting, innovative things that they're considering, like possibly using BitTorrent as a distribution protocol. Um, and you know, today they do kind of a, like a, a I'd call it like a jerry-rigged differential transfer. Um, so you actually push in all of these like layers if you have them already on the remote. Uh, you don't need to transfer. It's a little out of scope for this talk, but it's pretty cool. Um, so check that out if you're interested in distribution. Um, and then you can actually run it. So you can just say on another computer, docker run minus D minus P Nathan LeClaire slash open resty. So I should be clear that, you know, this is all Linux, right? So this is all very, very centric to Linux. Um, but you know, there's like tools that we have, for instance, the tool that I work on is Docker Machine, and it's meant to actually help you to bootstrap virtual machines to run Docker on to make all of this easier. Uh, so that, for instance, I use a Mac as my primary computer, um, but uh, like I use Docker relatively seamlessly uh, compared to just using it on uh, Linux natively. So. You can use automated builds on Docker Hub to learn from other people. Um, there's a lot of contribution to Docker because of Docker. This is a really, really crazy thing about Docker. All that you need to build the binary Docker is a running instance of Docker and, and make. So Docker actually uses Docker to build itself. Um, maybe that's a little confusing, I'm not really sure, but you know, you don't have to have Go or any of the dependencies installed to actually build Docker. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's been a lot of contribution activity um, is because, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to build Docker. You just have to install an older version of Docker and then you actually do the compile inside Docker itself. So if you're kind of like, what, mind blown, um, then I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's really cool. Um, Building Docker is pretty easy compared to a lot, a lot of open source projects, a lot. Um, so I'm totally out of time and I have to take questions, but I wanted to recommend that you check out Docker Machine, which is my project, and Docker Compose, which lets you actually kind of take a next level up and define like these are all the containers that run together. So you could basically say, for instance, I have four containers that make up my web app. These are all the properties that they have and how to run them. So it's just another form of automation. And we also have a thing called Docker Swarm that I think, kinda, I think kinda helps to, you know, it eventually will help to bridge the gap between development and operations a lot better. So um, that's the end of my slideshow. So uh, thanks a lot for, for listening and uh, for um, coming to see me talk. Uh, and now I'll be taking questions. So, so thanks. Oh, nice. Hi, what's up, man? Right. Um, so the question was uh, basically what 
uh, what does uh, the Docker development setup of the people who work at Docker Inc. and, and work in our office look like? Um, I'd say probably the majority of people today are using boot to Docker, um, which in case you're not familiar, is uh, uh, it's uh, like a little tool to create a VM and use it, a uh, virtual box VM. Um, historically, that's been the like tool that we recommend to kind of get started with Docker right away. Um, you know, right now we're sort of in the midst of a, a transition to essentially recommending that people use Docker machine by default. Um, but the workflow of VirtualBox is really, really similar. Um, so there's kind of a question about uh, XHive, uh, which in case you're not familiar, everybody is, uh, it's just like wrapper around the native Mac hypervisor. Um, it's really new, but it's kind of a really cool project. Um, and I don't think anyone is using XHive like as their primary development environment in Docker today. Um, but like Docker Inc that is. But for instance in Machine 050, which is the next release, we're gonna work really hard on making all the drivers pluggable so that you know if you want to use XHive, you can use that because you know, like you or anybody else could make a plugin for it and then it would be seamless just like Docker Machine is today. Um, so I mean I, I think like a lot of us are definitely looking at XHive and saying that looks pretty attractive because VirtualBox, uh, especially five, has been a little bit well, we've had a lot of issues with it, and partially it's our own fault, um, partially it's upstream, but you know, today we're kind of trying to figure out, because we're sort of encouraging everyone to move over to machine, how do we make that more reliable and you know, better? Um, so that's one of the ways we might be able to do it. But I think mostly people use Boots of Docker today. Um, I use Docker Machine, otherwise I'd be like in a lot of trouble <laughs> like with myself, because like, it was like, I work on the project, so if I didn't use it, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question, or? I have no else. Yeah, no problem. Right, uh, for 050, is that what you're asking about? The next release? Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, so, so our, our big goals for, for 050, for a Docker machine, um, one is lib machine, uh, which I've been working a lot on this week. Um, basically, historically, um, all the things that you can do with Docker machine, we had sort of this internal module in the project that we used. Um, and it's, it, was very, it was very tightly coupled to, to the CLI, so to the command line interface. Um, so all the internal bits of machine were sort of, you know, com complected together. Um, and, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, that's bad. One of which is that if people want to actually write applications that use Docker machine, they were having to do hacks like 
um, actually just calling out to the Docker machine binary and like parsing the flags themselves and that kind of stuff. So one of our goals is to actually make libmachine a separate, independent, usable component so that people can actually build things on top of it um, that are independent. I've been doing a lot of really exciting work on that this week. So like one of the kind of cool things is I finally have it to a usable state so I can do cool tricks like uh, take a little YAML file and like directly translate that into a, a machine like declaration um, configuration. So like that's where we want to go with that um, is to you know enable all this sort of like much more creative stuff with machine and, and decouple those components. So that's the goal of libmachine. The other really, really big goal is the plugin thing I was just talking about. So we actually want to make it so that, um, you know, like we have had a ton of interest in like people who want to write drivers for their own platform. Um, probably the one that people were most upset about us closing was uh, Parallels. Um, you know, a lot of people use Parallels for Mac uh, instead of VirtualBox. And so, you know, those people want to actually like use Docker machine with the same workflow and everything, um, but use Parallels as the back end. Um, so, you know, the plugins will actually allow us to sort of like, you know, do a similar act of like papering over all of the different providers um, and make it so that instead of me and Evan being the bottleneck, uh, well, Evan is the other maintainer on Docker machine. Like we've had all this interest in drivers uh, that we, you know, honestly, we can't evaluate and work on each one uh, and still improve the machine core. Uh, so the driver model is kind of a way, like the plug-in thing is a way to try and get around that, like to say, okay, you now have to maintain your own plug-in and like we'll provide a way to actually uh, bridge that into Docker machine so that you can use whatever you want. Um, and then it's sort of like let the best plug-in win. Um, you know, just so that we don't have to keep like adding more and more and more stuff into the core machine thing. We want to make it pluggable and more modular. Um, and then the third goal is basically just, you know, increased stability. Um, so the provisioning thing is kind of around that. There's no way to actually attempt, like reattempt a provisioning if something goes wrong with machine today. So, um, you know, it's, it's just around increased stability and for instance, uh, I put in a PR for a Docker machine provision command that would actually let you rerun provisioning. Um, so you could do something like, um, you know, uh, if you're, you accidentally deleted your swarm containers, like after you set them up one time with machine, you could rerun provisioning and it would actually go reboot those swarm containers. Um, that's a big problem that people have today is, um, you know, you set up your machine, but all of the, the stuff um, that revolves around like uh, provisioning that instance, that all happens at uh, machine create time and then there's no way to revisit it. Um, so does that kind of help to answer your question? So, like, Yes.